Amen. How many of you sense a move of God here in this place in your lives? As we see revival taking place, I believe God wants to do the same thing here. And so pray for your pastors. The enemy is coming after us in many ways. And I really believe that the Lord's coming back soon. And I believe there will be a revival in our land. As Johnny said, if my people, which are called by my name, would just humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then when we hear from heaven, he'll forgive our sin and he'll heal our land. And I even felt that the enemy didn't want this message to go forward because I believe it's so powerful today. Would you thank the worship team with me? Thank you guys for leading us in worship here today. I believe we have a, a powerful message. I believe it is something that the Lord is getting our hearts ready for something powerful to happen. I sense it in, in, in my life. I sense it, this God doing something great. I just sense the enemy coming against Beth and I and our health and, and in our family and different things. And so again, pray for us for strength of the next season that God has uh, for us because I believe it's gonna be a powerful season. God did some tremendous things in our first service and I believe we'll do it here as well. Uh, this text that I want to share with you today is a familiar text, even though we probably don't hear a lot about it because it really goes against the grain of our society today. Uh, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's referred to as the Beatitudes. Uh, in the sermon uh, by Jesus, he is making a declaration of his kingdom and what the character of each believer should be. That all these should be evident in our lives, in every believer. And I see that Jesus was teaching in contrast of the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders who had a superficial faith. They had an outward sense, but it didn't reach the heart. It didn't reach the inward quality of character that comes from knowing the Lord. I think it should be all of our desires that we would know God in a deeper way because it would cause us to seek him out. And what I want to talk about this morning can't be done on our own power. So these are spiritual qualities of the kingdom of God, which the Lord established here on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, would you look at the first verse with me in Matthew 5, 1 and 2, and your outlines are on the screen here this morning. And it says this, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, We know that this is Jesus' longest recorded sermon. Jesus here is describing the traits that he is looking for in his followers. And he calls those that we might live out these traits in our lives that you and I might be blessed. Because God has something special in store from those who follow in obedience to his word. The Beatitudes, it's almost a direct contradiction of the way our society lives. The best example of each of these traits is found in the life of Jesus himself. And if our goal is to be like Jesus, then the Beatitudes will help you and me to live each day as the Lord would desire for us. Now, notice that each of these qualities begin with the word blessed or blessed. The modern translation for some might be happy are those, but the word happy is more of an emotion based upon an outward. Uh, it's based upon the word happenstance. If your happenstance is good, then you're going to be happy. But blessed is something far more than that. It refers to the ultimate well-being and joy of those who share in the salvation of the kingdom of God. Now look under number one. It's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. And it says this, Blessed 
are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was again making a contrast between the spiritual proud, the self-sufficient, and those who have been humbled by the grace of God and have acknowledged their sin and therefore their dependence upon God to save them. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This first beatitude here, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is not surprising that this is the first one because I believe it is the key to all the other ones. I don't believe it's by accident. I do believe there is a spiritual sequence found here for good reason. For there is no entry into the kingdom of heaven apart from it. There is no one in the kingdom of God who is not poor in spirit. It is the fundamental characteristic of the Christian and the citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And as we dive into this, we shall see that it really means an emptying of self. While the other Beatitudes are an expression of the fullness of God, we cannot be filled until we are first empty. The words poor in spirit as meaning not being possessed by the worldly spirit. Jesus was again making a contrast from the spiritual proud and the self-sufficient to those who are humble. There is an essential difference between the natural man and the follower of Christ. The natural man, or the natural person, or the worldly person emphasizes self-reliance, self-confidence, self-expression, self-sufficiency. And you don't rely on your worldly riches. So what our Lord is concerned about here is the spirit. It is poverty of spirit. In other words, it ultimately means our own attitude of ourselves. Again, he's contrasting the proud to those who have been humbled. Would you say humbled? By his grace. Those who are proud and those who are humbled by the grace of God and have acknowledged their sin and acknowledged their dependence upon God to save them. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Isaiah 57, 15, he says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I will dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The meaning here is if one feels anything in the presence of God, then utter poverty of spirit, it ultimately means that you have never been in the presence of the Lord. When people ex experience the presence of the Lord, there is a common reaction. When the Lord appeared to Isaiah in a vision, he said, woe to me. I am a man of unclean lips around a bunch of people with unclean lips. When the presence of the Lord was there with Gideon and Moses, they both felt unworthy and unworthy for the task that God had called them to. When John is there on the island of Patmos and the Lord is coming to him in a vision, he says, I am as a dead man. When Peter is faced with the Lord and Jesus appears to him after the resurrection, Peter says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. When we experience the Lord, we begin to understand the meaning of what it means to be poor in spirit. It means a complete absence of pride. A complete absence of self-reliance. It means we are nothing in the presence of God and it causes us to live sober in his presence. In 2 Corinthians 5.10 it says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive 
whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we have done in this earthly body. I don't know about you, but that causes me to live soberly before the Lord. And again, I believe that the enemy of our soul is out after all of us who believe to try to get us knocked off, me included. And so that's why we need to have this spirit of poverty in a sense of being dependent upon God in all humility. This is why we want to live in the presence of the Lord now, to be blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In 1 John 2, 16, he says this. In fact, can you put up there for me 1 John uh, 2, 15? There we go. It's on your screen, not on your outline. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Go to the next verse which is on your outline or on the screen in 1 John 2, 16. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. It is the world in which we live in. Would you agree? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is where most society lives. It says, in the last days, will be in perilous times. People be boasters, arrogant, lover of self. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And here we are in our world and Jesus comes along and says something in stark contrast of where the world is going. That blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here's the contrast that he gives us of the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. For the world offers only temporal lust for physical pleasure, the lust for everything we see, and the pride in our possessions, the pride in our accomplishments, the pride in this and the pride in that. And this world is fading away. But if you do the will of the Father, you will live a blessed life here and forever. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then number two, found in Matthew 5, verse 4, it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be, say it with me. Now, To me, this does not appear to be talking that blessed or happy is the one who mourns the sorrowful experience of the death of someone. I don't believe that's what it's talking here. He's talking about spiritual things. Now, is it good to mourn for things that, for people who have passed away? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Mourning is a good thing, but I don't believe that's what he's talking about here in this place. I believe it is clear that Jesus is talking about something entirely spiritual in meaning. So this would refer to a spiritual mourning. Why? Because of the poverty of spirit referring to our spiritual condition. The Lord says, blessed are those who mourn in spirit. Paul the Apostle said it like this in Romans 7.24. He says this, O wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Wow. Paul, the apostle, one of the greatest apostles to ever live, wrote most of the New Testament. He says this, Oh, wretched man that I am. Paul is so grieved by his spiritual condition that he mourns about himself. He feels utterly hopeless about himself. He comes to the conclusion that nothing good that dwells in the flesh. So he begins to live in the spirit and to look forward to the kingdom of heaven. Look what he says here in Romans 8, 23. He goes on to say not only that, but we also, 
who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. How many of you know the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? Imagine how spiritual we would be if we didn't have this fleshly suit to deal with. Paul says, wretched man that I am. Nothing good dwells within me. <laughs> you ever feel like that? You should. <laughs> because then it makes way for something good. Amen. Because there's an emptying of ourselves, a mourning so that we might be filled. That we might be comforted in a spiritual sense. We mourn over the condition of sin. The Bible says that Jesus was a man of sorrows. We see that Jesus is there and he's mourning over Jerusalem. He's mourning because he is there and he's coming to save people and yet it is the ones that he came to save that rejected him. He mourned over this horrid, ugly, foul thing called sin, which had come into the life of to make life unhappy. Because many people in this world blame God for everything wrong in this world. And sin is to blame. I was thinking about this the other day. My grandmother, she lived to almost 100 years old in good health. Right before her 100th birthday, she slipped and fell. She was, it was a rainy day, and she was bringing milk to the dog, and she slipped and broke her hip. And she went downhill and passed away right before her 100th birthday. And so I'm uh, thinking about this, and my mom is there. My mom's probably about 80 at the time. <laughs> and my mom was so mourning the death of my grandmother, and I'm thinking to myself, Man, mom, you got to have all these years. You're 80 years old. You could have all these years with grandma. And yet she mourned. And I was thinking about that. And the reason being is death was never supposed to happen. Death was never supposed to happen. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, surely you shall die. And all death entered the world. Through one man, Adam, sin entered the world through one man who was perfect in every way. God himself, who came to this earth, fulfilled all the law and all the words of the prophet was fulfilled in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is all God in human form. But by the grace of God. So we mourn over the very nature of sin itself because we understand what sin means and the terrible results that takes place in sin. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The death of This promise is inexhaustible. Those who mourn in human anguish shall be comforted, shall be comforted by the passion of the Lord. And then in verse five, number three, it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Some of your texts might say, blessed are the gentle. Meek is a kind of a different word. We don't use that often. We know that the Bible says that Moses was the meekest man to live. Meek does not mean weak. Uh, me, uh, meek means to be strong, yet to be soft. And for a terrible illustration of this, I was watching a commercial the other day, and they were talking about this toilet paper. 
And this toilet paper was, was both strong but soft. And I was thinking to myself, they should call it meek paper. But Jesus is both strong, but he is gentle. Never forced himself on anyone. We look to Jesus as our example of meekness. It refers again to those who have been humbled before God. Why are we humbled before God? Because we realize that we are poor in spirit. We realize that we mourn over the horrid ugliness of what sin does in our lives. And because of that humbleness, because of that meekness, we not only share in the blessedness of heaven, but ultimately share in the kingdom of God upon this earth. See, the Christian is a spiritual citizen of the kingdom of heaven now. See, Jesus came, and it's, it's mind-boggling to think that God Almighty, who spoke things into existence, who said, let there be light, and there was. And he spoke all these things into existence, and the sure power of his words, and it took place. And yet God Almighty who came to this earth was not born in a palace, but he was born in a barn, which would be like a cave back in Bible days. Born in a manger, which was a feeding trough. I'm sure it was probably pretty smelly in there. <laughs> and yet he says he did not come to be served, but he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Do you see the humility? God Almighty came and he allowed himself to be beaten up beyond the recognition of a man. Wow. I would have done it a whole different way. So would you. But God himself humbled himself. He said, when you've seen me, Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Look what it says here in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Are you ready? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself, say humbled. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. That's why you and I are called to pick up our cross and follow him daily. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then number four. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be what? Satisfied. Satisfied. He's talking about a deep desire for personal righteousness which is in itself proof of spiritual rebirth. See, the enemy wants to do all he can to get us away from following in righteousness. He wants to do all he can to get us away from the rightness of God. And he, he puts things in place to try to, to get us to bite after. Bite after those temporal things that the world has to offer in pleasure. It is those worldly things that he tries to get us to bite on to. 
a physical pleasure, the lust for everything. But we are called to hunger and thirst after righteousness. He's talking about this personal righteousness, which is in itself a proof of rebirth. Those who are poor and empty in their own spiritual poverty recognize the depth of their need and hunger and thirst for the things of God. To hunger means to be needy and to thirst or a passion for righteousness. How many of you get hungry? How many of you are hungry now? It bothers me a little bit when my kids are saying, I'm starving. Because my kids know nothing about what it means to starve. But that hunger, it's that, that desire. As I'm sitting in my office and I can smell the blower from In-N-Out Burger travel over to my office. I get a desire for a double-double. And it takes me a whole half hour waiting in line. I know sometimes on a hot day in July in Visalia when it's 107 and I could go for a Lipton iced tea. There is that thirst. There is that desire. Hmm. There is a need and a hunger and a thirst for the things of God. What are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? And I'm not talking about food. What are you thirsty for? What is your desire? Do you have a thirst? Do you have a passion for righteousness? God supplies his spiritual need daily. And when we hunger and thirst for worldly things, we will not be satisfied. How many of you know that? The enemy tries to put these little things, these earthly things, these worldly things that you bite on them that you think it might satisfy and it's pleasure for a moment, but then it leads to a dark place called destruction. And it'll never satisfy you. The things of this world will never satisfy you. There's only one thing that will satisfy that God-shaped hole in our heart, and that is God and a relationship with him. But when we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we will be satisfied. Look at these verses here. Psalm 42, 1. He says this, As the deer gets thirsty for streams of water, I truly am thirsty for you, my God. Are you thirsty for the Lord? Because see, as the enemy knows his time is short, he wants you to be thirsty for worldly things. Because he wants to rip you off. He wants to destroy you and kill you. Why? Because he hates God and he hates you. Don't fall for it. Be thirsty. Be hungry for the things of God. It reminds me of Matthew 6, He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all those other things will fall into place. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I think I'm going to be forced to close with this verse here today. Stay tuned for next week and I will continue. But let me read this in Galatians 5.17. He says, for the lust, for the flesh lust against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So he's saying there is a battle. When you fall in the flesh, it works against the spirit. And when you build up the spirit, it works against the flesh. That's why you and I need to build up in the spirit. That's why you guys are here today. Amen? Amen. Because you came hungry and thirsty to hear the word of God because it's the only thing that could quench the thirst. He goes on to say this. So that you do not do the things that you wish. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are 
adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revilers, and alike, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness or gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's a sign that the Spirit of the living God is working in you. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh, which is passions and desires. Have you crucified the flesh and the passions and the desires? That's what we're all called to do. That's what revival's about. If my people, that's you, if just you in Visalia, if just you in Visalia, I believe, would humble yourselves, knowing that you have a poverty of spirit in your lives, apart from Christ, we are so dependent upon him, it's not funny for our spiritual condition. If you would merely mourn over sin and the results of sin and what it does in our lives and in the lives of those we love. If you and I would just be gentle and meek in the presence of the Lord, if you and I would hunger and thirst after righteousness, because if God's people, not the world, but if God's people who's called by his name will humble themselves, pray and seek his face and turn from his wicked ways, then will they hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. How many of you know we need healing? Amen. How many of you know we need revival? Yes. And revival is this. Revivalness is not craziness. It's not necessarily people speaking in tongues hanging from the chandeliers. Revival is me and you repenting of our sins. And hungry and thirsting for what is right. The enemy tries to bring friction, tries to do all this stuff. Don't fall for it. We're going to move in unity. We're all going to get close to the Lord. Amen. I think all of us could repent of something. I know I can. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward today. The Bible at the end of this chapter talks about being salt and light. We are to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. And I believe revival starts with the individual. I really do. I want to challenge all of us to be right with the Lord, wherever you're at. The enemy tries to get us to be crazy. Don't fall for it. We're coming back to the Lord today. Say amen. 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 And I believe we're going to see God move in a mighty way in our place and in our midst. Yes. Because we're going contrary to the world and we're submitting, as I was talking to Christy today, who's submitting to be baptized in obedience to the Lord, that we're going to submit in the same way and be obedient to the Lord. And we're going to choose to do it his way and not our own way. Would you stand with me? And I'm going to really ask you, so when I'm done praying, don't leave this place. We're going to sing this song because I think it's important. I shortened my sermon so we could pray and sing a song, okay? Because I know some of you are hungry and thirsty. But I believe this is serious stuff. Blessed are those. I want to be blessed. I need to confess things in my life and I know you do too. You know why? Because we all have this flesh suit that cries out.
spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is in contrary to the spirit. That's why I need to crucify the flesh and I need to build up my spirit. That's why we're here today. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We are called your people by our very names. To be called a Christian was literally, look at the little Christ running around. Lord, we are Christians called by your name. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to humble ourselves. That we might pray and seek your face. And Lord, that we might repent of our evil ways. That we might repent of the lust of the flesh. That we would repent and turn away from the lust of the eyes. That we would turn from the pride of life and that we would truly realize that we have poverty of spirit apart from you. Lord, today we come before you to mourn. That we would mourn our spiritual condition of failing you over and over again. That we would mourn over sin. The very opposite of the, what the world does. The world takes their sins and they have a parade and they flaunt it before you. Oh Lord, forgive us. But Lord, we don't do as the world does. We don't flaunt our sin before you in a parade. But Lord, we humble ourselves. Lord, you are worthy and we are not. Lord, we need you. And Lord, as we are in your very presence, we realize our poverty that we might say like, woe is me. I'm as a dead man in the, your presence. I am so unworthy. Yes, Lord, forgive us. Lord, may it be turned around in our lives, may it turned around in our church, may it be turned around in our city, may it be turned around in our nation. May it be turned around in this world, Lord God, that we have turned our back on you. Lord, help us to truly repent of our condition truly walk in humility because we know of our position. Lord, that we might be blessed. Lord, help us to seek out righteousness that we might be satisfied. Lord, we know you love us so much. Lord, help us to show our love by being obedient to you. Oh, Lord, we are so poor in spirit. Satisfied. You're the only one who heals. If it wasn't for your grace and for your act of allowing evil men to crucify you, we would not have salvation. Oh God, forgive us. If your people, which are called by your name, humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways. Lord, we know that you will hear from heaven. You will forgive our sin and you will heal our land. Forgive us, Lord. We come before you, Lord. And ask that you would forgive us that we would repent and go the opposite direction. Lord, that you might be glorified in our lives. We love you. And we thank you so much. We pray all these things in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Now don't move. Don't move. Now pray. If you need to deal with something with the Lord, do it now. And then let's sing this song together about the love of God in our lives. Listen, He did it for love. 
I don't know why, I don't know how, but he loves you and me. <laughs> Would you turn the lights down for a moment? May this be a holy moment between you and the Lord.